hard to see you, but I know there are some friendly faces out there. And I want to say thank you so much for being here. I know it's past some of y'all's bedtime because it's past my bedtime. And I am so honored to be speaking to you tonight. I want to thank Maggie for the invitation and also just for all the work that she's done to make tonight happen and the work she's done. Yes, let's give her a round of applause. And all the work she's done throughout the year for the, the many events. Um, thank you for everything that you're doing in our community, and I hope you also feel seen and celebrated tonight. As I was prepping for this talk tonight, I did some very serious research through my Instagram story, and I asked my friends to give me up to three synonyms and up to three anonyms for the phrase carry on. And the reason I did that is I want to do a little vibe check to just to see if the way I thought about the phrase aligned with the way other people thought about the phrase. And what I got for the synonyms were things like persistence, perseverance, endurance, hard work, continuing, keep going, pushing forward, a range of things. And for the anonym, I did not get a range. I got one thing, and that was quitting or to quit. Right. Yes, right? And I was like, that's really interesting. And I also found it really interesting as I just sat with that, that I noticed within myself, I had positive associations with carry on and all of its synonyms, and I had negative associations with quitting. And that's something I want to explore with you tonight and unpack a little bit. Now, all of my adult life, I have really thought of myself as someone who's really good at carrying on, and especially when we talk about endurance and persistence. As you heard, I have kind of an unusual skill set that combines all my passions, cultural anthropology, dance, production work, community activation, and I think I've been able to make that happen pretty much through determination and hard work and grit. Because I would very often come to a space and look around the room, tonight included, and be like, well, dang, I'm not the most talented, I'm not the most intelligent, I'm not the most experienced person in the space, but like what I can do is I can work really hard. And that'll be the way that I make this happen, right? And it became such a part of my identity, just endurance, that I just did it without question. And I'm sure some of you can relate to that. After all, like we have all been taught that the key to success, not a key, but the key to success is hard work and perseverance. And it's so ingrained in us that sometimes I don't think we take a beat to ask ourselves why we're working so hard or if what we're working for really aligns with who we want to be. But I've changed. This year has changed me a lot. And that was precipitated by one of the hardest uh, professional quits of my life. And so about a year ago, I lost a job. I was forced to walk away from two, essentially two organizations that I co-founded with Maddie Waters in 2016, the Pop-Up Project and their studio, Studio 34. And if you've ever uh, founded a nonprofit organization with zero startup cash, you know what it takes to make that work. And it is a lot of hard work, determination. You put all of your heart and soul and well-being and time and every single resource you have into making that thing happen and to lift that baby off the ground. And it became such a part of me, to be really honest, there were times I didn't really know where I ended and the organization began. And I 10 out of 10 do not recommend that, but that's the situation very often with nonprofits because they do demand passion from people. And so why did I quit that? Well, long story short, a little context, to build the organization, I was already working 50, 60, up to 80 hours a week on the regular for years. And as the organization grew, I was taking on more and more of the work I didn't want to do, actually, so that we could keep going. And I was moving further and further away from the work that I was really passionate about. And about this time last year, I received news of some pretty drastic funding cuts that were coming from several sources. And what those were going to require, if I stayed with the organization, were two things. Number one, that someone else would have to lose their job. And number two, that I'd have to do more of the work I didn't want to do. And I just said, I'm just not going to do that. I'm just not going to do that to myself or my staff. And so let's restructure this organization. And it makes the most sense for me to walk away and the people whose passions are still aligned with the programming to stay. And that was the right choice. I know that it was, because they're killing it. 
But it was a really hard choice, right? It was a really hard choice for me, and it's been way more of a process to recover than, from that than I anticipated. And so when I got this theme at the end of the year, carry on, or the end of the summer to carry on, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, <laughs> this must be like some kind of joke from the universe because I'm still reeling from this big quit, so how can I really speak honestly and authentically about this topic? And I was really going to turn it down, but as I thought about that choice, I began to, it started to be an invitation for me to examine like the internalized shame I had around quitting and to begin to question where that came from and unpack it a little bit. And so I get to share with you tonight what I learned. Thank you. <laughs> First, I want to acknowledge that while my negative association around quitting is a personal problem, I take accountability for that, it is a cultural one as well. And it is deeply ingrained. We value persistence and we look down on quitting. I know we've all heard the quote, winners never quit, quitters never win, by Vince Lombardi. You've probably seen it on a motivational poster in an office in the 90s. Also, the little kitten, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, right, the hang in there. We've all seen it. Um, in fact, in Julia Keller's book, Quitting a Life Strategy, which I'm gonna reference a lot in the next few minutes, she says, in a recent Pew survey, 80% of Americans define themselves as hardworking. Now, whether or not that's true, that is our most shared cultural identity. And I think it's so ingrained in, in many of us that even when we know quitting might be the best decision for our health and our well-being, we don't do it. We're embarrassed to do it. So where did this cultural value around persistence and hard work and, and, and continuing and the flip side of that, the shame around quitting come from? Well, I don't think any of you are going to be surprised. It's rather new in human history, and it is tied to the Industrial Revolution and the rise of capitalism. Not surprised, right? But let's go back to even before that. I did a little research on the etymology of the word quit, and turns out it comes from the Latin root words for to be quiet and to be still. And in Old English, it meant to set free. And that's really lovely. But then, you know, Industrial Revolution and the rise of capitalism, we all know that that had massive shifts culturally and socially in the United States and Western Europe. And one of those shifts was that mass fortunes were being amassed by a few, and then a lot of people were living in really awful urban poverty for the first time. And that began to create a cultural tension, and specifically class tensions. And that needed a solution. It needed an answer. And that answer came in the form of an idea that was very powerful because it had enough truth to be persuasive. But it lacked the full truth so that it could obscure some of the systemic realities that were propping up and supporting that new system. And that idea, you guessed it, is that hard work and perseverance are the, the key to success. And so what that tells you is, well, if you failed, that's your part. If you're, if you're poor, that's your fault, right? And there were a lot of bits of cultural content coming out during this time that were reinforcing that idea. And there's a lot of information on that. And at the same time, what that did is it took quitting from just another life strategy and life choice, and it made it something to be ashamed of. It made it a moral failure. And so we think of quitters as losers, as unreliable, and it's an unacceptable choice, right? And we're really still living in that cultural context. And what does that do to us as humans? Well, just a little bit of information on that. In 2022, the International Workforce and Wellbeing Mindset Report said the majority, 73% of workers in the US and Western Europe report moderate to severe levels of stress, and 34% are experiencing burnout. Now, I'm gonna get back to burnout in a minute. But before I do, I wanna give you five hot takes on quitting real quick. Number one, you're gonna be judged, and you'll judge yourself. Number two, there's no guarantee that it's gonna work out. You might be taking a leap, leap of faith into a big failure. Three, when you pull your time and energy and resources out of something, it might negatively affect others, and so that's something to consider as you decide whether or not you're gonna continue. If it's a big quit, it's gonna be scary and also potentially painful you might be leaving some things you really love. 
And then number five, it's really important that I acknowledge this, that quitting is related to privilege. The more privilege that you have, the more opportunities to quit you're gonna have without it being catastrophic, and the more likely that whatever you wanna do next is gonna be successful. So it's important to acknowledge that. However, most of us do have a range in which we can choose whether or not we continue with something or we move on. And I just wanted to say all of that because I wanna acknowledge that quitting is serious business. It's not something I'm suggesting should be done lightly. But what I am suggesting is that it's potentially a wonderful act of self-love because it's essentially giving you permission to walk away with the things that don't align with who or what you want to be. Keller says, quitting is an escape hatch, a long shot, a shortcut, a leap of imagination, a fist raised in resistance, a saving grace and a potential disaster, because it may backfire in spectacular ways, sabotaging careers and blowing up relationships. It can ruin your life and it can save it too. So, if we take the cultural shame of quitting away and we accept that it's a viable option, how do we know when we should quit? Well, I wish there was a book that told us that. There's not. But your brain and your body are going to be sending you messages about this all the time. In fact, Keller says that the very moment you begin to dream about quitting, there's already a complex psychophysiological process at play where your brain and your body are in communication about your frustration, your exertion, your exhaustion, and you're constantly doing like a self-monitoring of your ROI, your return on your energetic investment. She says, our bodies try their damnedest to let us know when we're overloaded. Heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure all shoot up. Importantly, this distress isn't just physical. Psychological stress can be equally acute. If our lives have somehow gotten away from us, if we're not doing what feels right, if we're not nourishing our bodies and our souls properly, if we don't live according to the values and standards we once envisioned for ourselves, the impact on our overall well-being can be catastrophic. And we can learn a little bit about this psychophysiological process from fish. Keller shares about Dr. Misha Ahrens and his team of scientists who work with zebrafish. Zebrafish instinctively swim against the current. And so these scientists trick the fish with lasers. I don't know how that happens, but they trick them into thinking they were making no progress in their effort. And then they monitored what was happening in their brains. And what they saw is like the moment that they decided to give up was the activation of the glial cells in the brain. Now, previously, glial cells were thought to just be maintenance cells that did repair work on neurons. We're learning a lot more about the brain now. And they have learned a lot about glial cells, including the fact that they sort of receive the message from your brain and your neurons about this exertion, this ROI, and they activate that cognitive desire in you to give up. Well, I found it really interesting that as long the scientists could keep those glial cells turned on in the fish, and as long as that cell was turned on, they would just float passively in the water. As soon as it was turned off, they would start to swim again. Now, you're not a fish. Your brain is way more complicated, and you will probably try several different paths, right, to success before you, that activation of your glial cell happens. And when it does happen, you can choose to override that system and keep going. But it's still going to be happening in your body, right? That's still going to be going on. And I really think that that's what we call burnout. That is not in the science yet, but I think they're going to prove me right one day. So you guys, please remember that I said it first. <laughs> You're also not a fish in that you're not going to be content just floating passively in the water, which would be amazing. I wish we were. You're going to be looking for that next thing to put your love and your purpose and your energy toward, but you might not figure it out right away. There might be a transition period, and I'm going to call this the dreaded liminal space. So liminal spaces are defined as betwixt and between. You're neither who and what you used to be, but you don't have your new situation and your new identity figured out yet. It is a space of sustained uncertainty that is very uncomfortable. It is also the space where reimagining happen, where reevaluation happen, where healing happens, and hopefully greater clarity. It is the space, if you can sit in it, that is going to allow you to build something better for yourself in the future. And it sucks. I have to be honest that I did not want to do this part, and I have fought it tooth and nail. I wanted to jump right into my next thing without missing a beat. And when that didn't happen, I hit a real low. 
Um, and I'd hit a low because there were a lot of things I was resisting seeing that I needed to see, but I did not want to see. For example, I really didn't want to see what people thought about me once because I'd lost a role. I was no longer perceived as useful or relevant to them. And I was faced with the fact that I had been investing in a lot of relationships as if they were community when really they were transactional. And that stinks. But nobody asked me to do that, right? The gift of that is you can move forward with greater clarity around how you're investing your time and your energy and your emotional and your resources and your love. And that's a beautiful gift. The other thing I didn't want to look at is like what, what about productivity gave me a sense of value? And why had I been working 60, 70, 80 hours a week in the first place? I built Papa Project. I didn't have to build it in that way. And yet I did, because I was seeking value from productivity in a capitalist system. And so when I quit, that's giving me the space and time to create something healthier for myself with greater boundaries around my well-being, both my emotional, social, and my time well-being. So quitting is hard, because it comes with judgment, it comes with that dreaded liminal space, and it's full of social significance. And while we're all sitting here trying to process what it is we would walk away from, I want to acknowledge something real quick. And this might seem obvious, but it's important to say. Every time you choose to do something, you are already choosing not to do something else. So if you choose to persist in that job that's draining your soul, you are actually quitting on the potential for a better option. If you persist in a relationship or in a community where your emotional well-being is not being valued, you are quitting on the potential for finding a better match with yourself. And so I just want to say that you get this one wild and precious life. Thank you, Mary Oliver. What do you want to do with it? Give yourself permission to evaluate the things that you're giving your time and your energy and your resources to and to walk away with the, from the things that don't align with you. And with that in mind, I want to offer to you tonight that the anonym of quitting, sorry, the anonym of carrying on is not quitting in the way that we think of it, but it is moving on. It is moving on to an option that's better for your life and your well-being and your happiness. And when I was thinking about all of this, I was like, oh, God, well, what is worthy of our one wild and precious life? And I was lucky to come across this work by Arthur Brooks, who's a Harvard psychologist who studies happiness. And he said two things I want to share real quickly with you tonight. First, that happiness is a direction and it's not a destination. You are never going to arrive in a place where you get to sit comfortably in your happiness. It's going to take constant evaluation and flexibility and adaptation and willingness to change direction. Remain flexible if you want your, to be happy. The second thing he said is that happiness is made up of three parts, meaning, satisfaction, and enjoyment. And the happiest people have a pretty good balance of those three things. And when I looked back on my life over the last 10 years, I was like, man, I got two out of three. <laughs> I had a lot of meaning and satisfaction. But I had worked myself so hard that I took away all the enjoyment. And so moving forward, I get to try to create a life with better balance for myself and my family. And so even though quitting was really, really hard, it is also one of the greatest acts of self-love I'm giving myself, even though I'm still figuring it out in that dreaded liminal space. As I close, I want to just say I'm not suggesting that you all go out and quit everything tonight. That would be highly irresponsible, and I will deny it if you tell people I've said that. <laughs> I am just saying that you deserve to give your energy and your love and yourself to things that are, that are the most meaningful to you. I am suggesting that we stop valorizing grind culture and that we start to recognize the importance of rest and play. Thank you for being here and thank you for coming to my TED Talk.